<laughs> so you are Norwegian, Chris? I am. Ah. That's the uncertainty range that we are playing with also, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's it's two minutes past the hour now, so maybe we we start. Can you guys still see my screen or no? Yep. Oh, not yet. No. 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 It disappeared. We did have it. <clears throat> I see it now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can I just do a quick reminder to everybody turning their video off if they're just participating, please? I see the screen. I hope I don't get a presentation again. Okay. Are we good to go? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for calling into this uh, first webinar today uh, titled uh, Workflows for Handling Uncertainty. Uh, as I assembled really the answer. Um, I will be uh, facilitating this um, webinar today together with Chris Townsend, and uh, we have our guest speaker here, um, Mark Bentley. Um, to start with, we would like to uh, give a quick introduction on uh, the FORCE group as a whole, and then uh, Chris will take that slide, and then I will come afterwards to introduce the speaker, uh, give some kind of um, broad background on how we intend to run this uh, webinar, so we have uh, some kind of order in uh, carrying this out, and then uh, we will uh, hand over to Mark to start the presentation from there. So, Chris, uh, you can uh, go for this now with uh, the next slide. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Townsend. For those who don't know me, <laughs> um, I work as a consultant, and I'm currently working for ArcBP at the moment. Um, and I've been a part of the IRM group or the Integrated Reservoir Modeling Group in force for probably about four years now. Um, and I just want to say a couple of words about the um, the aims of the group. Um, and it's basically to stimulate experience and exchange of competence between different disciplines in the area of integrated reservoir modeling. And we're talking about not just 3D geomodeling, but also reservoir engineering, petrophysics, geophysics, um, and any other group that feel that they can have a contribution to integrated 3D modeling. Um, we promote and organize information sharing, and we try and do this through workshops and seminars. Uh, we've run a number of lunch and learns over the last few years, and Pascal's put in here field trips. But I'm not sure we've actually run one yet. <laughs> um, and uh, we we really encourage people to come to us with ideas and suggestions on how we can um, improve or run topics for sharing and um, yeah for sharing information. And uh, I'll highlight we have Tron Bearded as our current chairman. Um, so if you have any ideas, the best person to start with is Tron. Send him an email. Or give me a call or whatever. Yeah. Okay, Pascal. Okay. And now, uh, yeah, and next I would like to introduce uh, the guest speaker. Uh, he's uh, Dr. Mark Bentley. He's, uh, he's uh, right here on the top left corner of the screen, if you can see. Uh, he has a geoscience background, as um, you have, I've listed out on the slide, which you can all see. Uh, initially started work with uh, Shell for quite a number of years before switching to uh, consulting. And now he has some uh, part-time role at the University of, uh, sorry, the Harriet Watts University. That's this uh, Institute of Geoenergy Engineering. Uh, he's the co-author of this uh, book, which you see on the right-hand side, uh, Reservoir Model Design, uh, which is written with uh, Phil Ringrose, which quite a number of us know. Uh, and his interests uh, essentially is reservoir modeling and simulation and their application to uh, handling subsurface uncertainties and risks. Uh, without uh, much more to say on that part, I will go to uh, what we intend to have today. For the webinar, we intend to follow this um, layout. Uh, the aim here is to uh, 
is to focus on the subject. And the subject here is, are we really capturing the complete reservoir uncertainties that we have in the models that we, we generate? Um, Mark will be going through four distinct parts. Uh, in, the plan is to have 15 minutes for each of these parts, and then questions will be taken uh, after these 15 minutes. Please endeavor to type in your questions in the chat as we go on. Myself and Chris, uh, who are the facilitators, will uh, pick a couple of questions and then throw this out to the uh, to the speaker to address. Uh, perhaps in some cases we might need to call on the um, person who posts the chat or the question to to express himself uh, clearer if by any chance we don't capture the, the, the content correctly. Uh, we intend to have 15 minutes discussion. Uh, and yes, like I mentioned, uh, if you wish to uh, contribute to this um, discussion, you can uh, indicate by raising your hands. Myself and Chris will be on the lookout to uh, allow people join in the discussion while uh, Mark is making his explanation. So the plan is to have two to three to four minutes per question. And then afterwards, uh, towards the end, after the four parts are completely taken, then uh, we would have a summary and then we'll come to the close for the day. Um, Please bear in mind that the focus here uh, is to keep our, our thoughts mainly on the subject of discussion. And we want to have very limited or no reference to any of the modeling tools here. So mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty important to uh, make note of. Okay, so other than that, uh, I would uh, like to hand over to Mark to uh, kick it off from here. Thank you. Okay, well, th thank you very much, Pascal and uh, and Chris for the introduction. Um, uh, I'm coming at this principally as a, as a practitioner. So the word ensemble, of course, is out there. So if you were tuning in, hoping for a two hour lecture on the internal working of the of the ensemble, calm and filter, then I'm sorry is the only word I can say. Um, firstly, because I can't do it. And, and secondly, because that's not really the purpose of the exercise. So I think I was invited here initially by Pascal um, because I do have one small advantage and that's by virtue of the role in tracks, you get to give uh, a number of reservoir modeling courses during the year uh, and also courses on risk and uncertainty with different people um, around the business around, around the world. And it's a very nice way of getting an overview. And I'm struck by, especially in this world of the ensemble, uh, for some groups, <coughs> um, it's the thing and, and there's a high degree of belief and, and confidence and that you know it's the way to go. Uh, with other groups uh, they feel exactly the opposite and feel equally impassioned but in the other direction and there's quite a lot of groups out there uh, when I mention the word ensemble and they just I've never heard of it. Um, it, it varies, enormously, varies enormously depending on where you are around the world so it's rather nice to be invited here to force thank you very much for that um, which is in many respects sort of the epicenter of the ensemble world compared to it. Things are going on in other places in the world, but it's very much a, a lot of it's been driven um, from the Norwegian community. So no more appropriate place than this then. So I want to start just with something very straightforward. Well, sorry, yeah, overview first. I should say some of you, it's nice to see some familiar names in, in the list there. So hello to the, those of you. If I'm looking to one side, it's because I'm looking at the chat on the other screen. Uh, hello to all those familiar faces. If you have been on the reservoir modeling classes, there's some of this you will have heard before. In order to make it different, what I've done, I've taken the material, I've thrown half the slides away, I've added new ones in, and I've mixed up the order. Um, so if I get lost, you know, that, that's why. Uh, this, it keeps it fresh though. So we put it into these four parts. And the first part is just some definitions to get us going, um, uh, a quick run through the base case, and then, and then our options. And I'll, I'll pose a question for you, um, and then we'll, We'll take that first break session. Uh, the second piece, in, I want to come at it from the angle of scenarios, which is very much my background, um, and take us through some absolute fundamentals like root cause, and to take us then into the third part, into the world of the ensemble, and then to share some experiences. Uh, and this is very much about sharing experiences. The um, uh, I'm indebted to the folk at Maersk actually from a few years ago who said, don't, don't turn up and tell us how to do it. And, and it took me a while to think about that. It's a conversation. It's a conversation and there's choice. So I hope what I can do today is just provide material that helps us to have that conversation and to, and to think about choice. Because as practitioners, basically we have to make a choice. Uh, so in the fourth part, I'm just going to finish off with a case study for often like uh, a, a case. And I'm going to 
use that as an opportunity to reflect on whether the approach that was taken for that case, which was a, an ensemble of sorts, uh, was it the right thing or the wrong thing? Was it enough or not enough? Or could it, could it have been done in a different way? And that's, again, something for you to, uh, so, some of you to th think about what would you have done in that field case? And we'll finish on this theme of choice because it is fundamentally a, a choice. So to get us going, definitions, definitions and uh, open up, open the box on, on choices. Um, why, why are we actually doing this in the first place? Well, you know, we're doing this, this is a very familiar image. Uh, if you've done risk and uncertainty classes, you know, the Titanic does tend to come up. We're very familiar with the world of the best technical case, BTC, whatever word you have for it, base case, reference case. Um, fine. You know, the reference case in this case was that they really didn't expect to hit an iceberg. So, you know, what, what are we here for? Well, we're basically in a sense, we're spotting icebergs. That's what we're trying to do. And a, and a few terms to help us along the way. We're in the area of uncertainty and risk. Still, uh, there's often a tendency to use these words interchangeably, which that doesn't help, definitely doesn't help communication. So uh, just a couple of definitions to get us going. Uncertainty, the inability to specify something exactly. You know, we know that something exists, we just can't be specific and we can put probabilities on it. If we have uncertainties, that causes or opens us up to risk. So risk, uh, highly contextual, generally associated with loss, it can be an upside. Uh, if you have no uncertainties, in principle, you have no risks. I think that's generally, generally true. For today, we're talking about this on the left. We're talking about uncertainties. Yeah, risk is the overlay that comes after. So the focus today, very much on uncertainties. And so I want to chuck another couple of definitions in here, which I'll take forward into the, the sessions, and it's these two. Um, it's distinguishing root cause uncertainties from sensitivities. And I'll, I'll clarify that uh, in the in the second uh, segment. But root cause uncertainties uh, is the ones that really determine success for a project. Uh, sensitivities, it's things we're not sure about, and they do affect the outcome, but they're sort of second order things. And I'm, I'm going to suggest today that it, it can be helpful to distinguish these two root cause versus sensitivities. So some definitions to get us going. And a choice. And again, if you've been on the courses, you'll be familiar with this, with the triangle. They're going to use this, uh, use a couple of metaphors today. So I have some icebergs and trees and triangles and dartboards. I think that's enough metaphors for one day. In terms of how we approach uncertainty, you, you can pretty much classify um, everyone in the world somewhere within this triangle. Um, there's a version of this I use on courses where I plot companies on here, but I know this is being recorded and is going on YouTube and just to avoid litigation, I'm not going to do that. But I would ask you to have a think about where you are in here. At the top is the best guesses. Um, the base case modeling, you know, which is anchored on a preferred base case. And at the bottom of the triangle, it's the multiple modeling, multiple modeling folk. Uh, and there you can go two ways. You can either go towards the stochastic uh, apex or towards the more deterministic apex, but it's a triangle. So you can end up anywhere in the triangle. So the question for you, just just uh, not one for the chat, but just hold hold the thought. Where do you think you are on that triangle? So have a think about that. And then the follow up question to that, and uh, I think Pascal's monitoring the chat here. You're going to hate me for this, Pascal. We haven't fully talked through this, but I'd like you to have a think about uh, where do you think you'd like to be? Where is the place to be generally? I, I know there's always a it depends and you know it depends on the circumstances, which is true. But broadly speaking, there is there is a most people have a preference somewhere within this triangle where they, where they would like to head for, for most projects. And I want you to type it in the chat. And this is I know there's only 207 of us. And this is why Pascal's never going to ask me to do this again. Um, I just want you to type in a couple of letters. So if, if you're really at the apex at the top there for best case, that's a B. If you like multiple stochastic uh, apex, then an S. And if you're a multiple deterministic person, then then the D, but don't don't be limited to the apexes. So this is what I'd like you to choose, and then just type, just type in. And Pascal, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it to you to see what you can do. Let's see where everyone plots up. If you're if you best guess, would be you like a bit of stochastics, then you're you're a BS. Likewise, BD. If you're just off the corner of the S corner, you're are you an SB or an X? But like Myers Briggs, this isn't it? And so on. And if you really, you know, there's someone who probably, you know, is somewhere in the middle there. If you really 
just can't decide today if you're sort of uh, sort of central politics, if you like, then you sort of be, you're a BSD. How are you doing, Pascal? It's a, it's a flurry of uh, chats here. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but most people, most people are usually either, I mean, the DS, there's, uh, there's uh, SD and uh, DB and there's SB. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Pascal, I'll leave it to you. But the very few, but very few people are the at the apex. So very few bees. Okay. No, very few people are the apexes. That's fair. Oh, and you, oh right. We're mostly not the apexes. No, there was an S first of all, but that's I think I hadn't yes, put this. That was the first one, yes. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I'd love it if you could spreadsheet that, Pascal, but that's probably asking you a bit too much. Is there other it works on a training course because we just sort of plotted on a on a on a flip chart. But um it would be nice actually to get that. It'd be an interesting thing to cluster. I can feel a contour map coming off. In fact, principal component analysis. There we go. I mean, what we can say in terms of people around the world, if I make the generality, which I think is legally uh, safe for me, um, you know, the best best guesses, the folk who really do single case modeling are often working onshore projects, which are highly incremental. Uh, some part, the parts of the world which are dominated by onshore often often are at the be best uh, best guess end. Even if you your answers are sort of on the SDDS bottom apex here, when it gets into mature fields, we often end up drifting towards the top, simply because it gets a bit complicated. Um, I wasn't going to mention ensemble Kalman filter again, but you know there are techniques for handling, for hand, in a basic way for handling uh, production data. But on the whole, uh, if, if I think of the global community, there's a tendency to drift back towards the top on the principle that you have data now. So our uncertainties are going away, which I, I must admit, I do believe is not, not true. Uh, come back on that in, a later, in the later segment. But those are the reasons for floating to the top. Um, on the bottom left, if you're from a research group or close to a research group where these sort of tools are being generated, of course, there's an inevitability that you sort of, especially if your company is sponsoring them. Um, for folk who just fundamentally as a, as a group, as a company, like concept-led approaches that tends to tends to lead you to the bottom right it's depending on it's statistically led or concept-led and those are those are general truisms and if you're in the middle it's probably maybe it's just because you can't decide that's probably a little bit unkind but sort of true but sort of true so where are you on that triangle where where should we be and that relates to this quick question of you know ensembles where where do we think ensembles are taking us uh, what's definitely not okay is just to wander around the triangle and just say, well, you know, it depends, because that that's sort of very close to anarchy within a company, and you get then the worst case scenario, which is that different people in different asset teams inside the same company do things in completely different ways. Uh, that's very common as well, and um, that seems to be the situation that creates the most. What's the word? Um, a nice. I want. I want a nice word. Uh, Time-consuming discussion, shall we say, <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons for tabling this at force. Really, is to let's see as a community bring bring some of the discussions out into the open as a way of maybe uh, helping some of those discussions inside companies and trying to avoid this particular word here. So let's uh, just just to round off this first segment. You know what what's wrong with being at the top? I think to a, to a force audience, I think you've more or less left the top, but I strongly suspect if we went into the companies and really had a look to the portfolios, there will be some there will be some big uh, base case models, especially in mature fields. A colleague and friend, uh, Phil Ringrose, you know, used to say in the company, um, a Norwegian company, we're not mentioning company names, so it's a Norwegian company that used to be strongly related to the state and to oil, but that, I won't mention the name. But said, you know, that there was there was a big drive towards being along the bottom of the triangle. But then actually, when you actually really go into the asset teams, quite often there's a big model in the background at the top there. And that was integrated reservoir modeling, the thing that Chris mentioned in the introduction, IRM, um, which goes back to when Chris and I were boys, you know, just coming into the industry. That was the fashion in sort of late 80s. And it's encapsulated by this now rather old diagram, um, which nevertheless explains it, which is that you have in the middle here. Uh, the vehicle for integration, which is usually a simulator, because that's the one place where everything ends up. And then everyone does their bit, and then off the simulation engineer goes, who's normally a reservoir engineer, and they head off. And uh, eventually, after a long period of history matching, there'll be probably a sensitivity analysis, but by then, everyone's working on something else, apart from that one 
not long suffering simulation engineer. So essentially it's very base case rooted. If there's anything significant wrong in any of these components, then the whole thing is essentially flawed from the word go. Um, that's life at the top apex. It's it's an enormous guess. Very common around the world is, is low, mid, low mid high case modeling. And then of course it depends how did you make the low and the high case, but very often it's not far from that top apex when you really talk to people and say, well, how did you get the low mid high? Um, if you ask which one did you do first? Well, it's almost always the middle one. So there's the anchor goes down. Uh, and then the low and the high case are often symmetrical deviations from the from the anchor point. But when it comes to making a decision, which one do you take? Well, I think I don't think I've ever seen a case where they don't actually come back onto essentially the number you first thought of. So even as you're moving down away from that apex, often you're closer to the apex than you really think. What's the problem with it? Well, the problem is data insufficiency. We're, we're just not in a, a situation of statistical significance. Um, we don't have enough information to be that, or we shouldn't have enough information to be that confident in a guess, uh, because it is a guess. And it's this problem, it's this thing that we have data, we have model, we have truth. Again, for those who've been on the courses, you'll be hopefully familiar with that, because I say it enough times. Three things out there, data, model, truth, generally, almost always, not the same. We just don't have the data. We don't get to see the truth case. The more I think about it over the years, I know we shouldn't we shouldn't land on be overly dogmatic, but I, I'd say on this particular one, I am. The, the advantage is that it's simple. Um, you make your best guess and it provides comfort that you've done this technical best. So for our managers, managers who've employed us all to be technical experts, we can say we have made a technical best guess. Um, the disadvantages are everything else. I, I would say as a piece of science, it's a flawed process. If if we accept data not equal to model, not equal to truth, um, if you accept that, that we're in this world of, data, of statistical data insufficiency, then it is fundamentally a flawed process. The the uh, uh, thing is in our in our industry, it's actually remarkably forgiving because it takes time to do everything. We can make these guesses. And they're often before we really realize they're completely wrong. The people who are involved in making a guess are potentially moved into another department or possibly even another company or even another career. You know, you're not always there to see the consequences of the guesses that you make. Also, sometimes, because guesses famously are always wrong, but we, we sort of sometimes get away with it. Or when something is beginning to go wrong, we get new data. So the model is already rebuilt before we really have a chance to say, oh yeah, that first model was wrong. Things things have moved on. So it's in this way, the industry is very forgiving and it's allowed us to get away with this uh, a process, which in other industries where you get results much more quickly, <clears throat> then um, uh, they find out about it and we don't. And the, the biggest one for me is this thing of modeling for comfort. The process of making a guess guess and anchoring and feeling good about it, actually it creates overconfidence in that guess, overconfidence in a decision. So it's modeling for comfort, whereas I would argue what we're supposed to be doing with reservoir modeling is, if anything, creating discomfort. Yeah, it's illustrating risks and then saying, look, it could, there's an iceberg out there. Are you absolutely sure you want to take that route? As opposed to saying, our best guess is that we'll probably miss the iceberg. After all, they're quite small. So we have options uh, and this we're heading towards that first uh, break now. Um, if you haven't put anything in the chat, SB or BS or DS or whatever, please do now. Um, I think I suggest that a useful way of looking at it is just to see all of these things as tools. And we have choice. And so along the bottom is complexity, so easy on the left. I don't want to say complex on the right because it's off putting, so just put more thought required. But then we do have bias about whether we, it's the bottom, bottom of the triangle, are, are we inclined more to deterministic solutions or more to stochastic solutions? What's our blend going to be? And on here, we can pretty much plot our various options, our tools, the simplest tool of which um, I don't think anyone, any of us actually do this. Um, I, I do suspect that at the very top of a company, sometimes it's a bit like that, where you get down to the board level and they just have to sit around and say, someone has to say, well, what are we going to do? They look at it and it often feels like it's a bit of a toss of the coin. You can do that. I think we'd call that stochastic and relatively easy. If you want to be a bit more sophisticated, we can roll some dice. 
Um, if you want to be a bit more elegant, there's Monte Carlo. And then on the right, of course, there's the word of the ensemble, <coughs> or stochastically driven ensemble in that case. If you prefer determinism, you can't do simple and just make a best guess, but it has those issues we just talked about. You could do a best guess with some sensitivities. It's a slight improvement. Low mid high case models, although they still tend to be anchored, or, or you can go for scenarios, true scenarios, where you, you basically attempt to take up, pull up the anchor. And you can blend. So you see the word sensitivity there, and you may be already thinking, oh, hang on a minute, I, I, I do that, or, or I do that. So the, indeed, you, you can begin to blend. You don't have to be at the apex of a triangle, on the apex. So those were our options. So Pascal and, and Chris, uh, that, that gets the ball rolling. Any thoughts from the chat? Uh, thank you. There have been a number of questions come in. Um, there's one I want to pick up on in particular, but I'll get back to that in a in a in a minute. Um, but I I'm worried, slightly worried about the way you're using the words deterministic and stochastic, because there are elements of both in all models and uh, if we think about stochastic um, st stochastic modeling techniques really help us to describe geology in a good way i think and it's not just about stochastic models or non-stochastic models um, anyway i would like to invite Girid to come up um, for those who don't know Girid Johnson, can you can you open your microphone, Girid? Yes, hi. I yeah. haven't heard from Girid. Just hold on a minute, Girid. Hold on, I'm going to introduce you. Girid did a PhD and she was very prominent in Norsh Kidro and she left the oil industry 20 years ago. And I'm stunned to see her name, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Who's going to ask you a question? She went, she went yeah. up to be a banker. Yeah, I did. Well, I, did. I worked in, as an actuary in, in, in insurance, in fact, yes. But yeah. I've been back for 10 years, so. But but in my view, it's it's not the tools that are difficult, but it's to open our kind of our minds and our heads and to, to realise that we have, when you do an interpretation, a depth conversion, geological concept of your view on, on the reservoir in any of the disciplines, to open up and to say that, you know, there are possibilities here and scenarios and, and, and to include those scenarios. And I see that when we change from kind of one model to another, it's often a new view on the interpretation, a new view on the depth conversion, a new view on the sedimentology. So I would like, you know, somewhere in between, on the baseline between, so include those scenarios in the, with probabilities in the stochastic, like in a stochastic way. But the difficulty is not in the tools, but in our heads. That's what I, I find. So, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but uh, to have so, everyone kind of open up uh, that I think that's the most that we, we try to we try to do. But um, I think we, that's where we're failing in, 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 in fact. Yeah, I think some people like your comments there. We're getting some claps. Um, <laughs> OK, I'll, Mark, I'll take the on. next. The next, uh, I'll just pick one question from the uh, list here. Uh, there's Thomas Gom Thetin. If you can come up and just ask your question. Or yes, give you a uh, yes, it was a question to, to Mark actually, he's been working on this kind of modeling for a long time. And and and, and as uh, Girid uh, said, uh, part of the challenge is to, that the problem sits in the heads of people <laughs> to yeah. see the alternatives. And how should we work to, uh, mitigate that? How can we work to avoid bias in the models we create? Yeah, uh, well, avoiding bias. Well, this is, we're into Carmen and Tversky and thinking fast and slow, which I guess is some of your familiar, as your familiar face actually, how it talks. Um, I mean, the, there's an interesting take, I guess a lot, of, I wasn't going to talk too much about bias in heuristics today, but there's, uh, I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with the work of Carmen and Tversky, uh, Reiner Bradford, I think. In his, in his work, he refers to them, and they were the, the social psychologists who looked, talked about underlying biases and what we can do about it. And then Daniel Kahneman is very instructive. He got the Nobel Prize for this, but he's very instructive in that he's now 87 years old and he says, you know, I'm still biased. Um, and his take, in fact, don't go away. <laughs> I'm not keeping this fresh and interactive, isn't that, Chris? Okay, in the newspaper two weekends ago, that's Daniel Kahneman. There we are. He's, uh, 
87 now. They said, did you think you'd still be working by now? And he said, no, I thought I'd be dead, which is, there you go. That's someone who spent their life forecasting. Um, new book by him for fans, he's one of my heroes, uh, called Noise. And what his take on it um, was that actually as individuals, we just don't get over this. So uh, groups are the better way. In fact, he says he put his, puts his faith in organisations, which is not at all what some people would go for, simply because you've got a chance organisationally of opening up everyone's heads, as uh, Gerard says. And if you can actually come get a workflow that does that, and you can hold it all together, that, that's your best chance of debiasing. Then if anyone else has got any thoughts on that, Chris or Pascal? Or anyone? Well, I will say one thing, Mark. Could yeah. you put a link to that newspaper article and the book in, in the chat somewhere? It's a bit hard to see it when you hold it in front of the camera. Yes, it was actually in The Observer two weeks ago, but the book is called Noise. And okay, just well, just put it, put, it in, put it in the chat and then everyone's got access to it. Yeah, a bit late. Not now, but maybe later. Yeah. Yeah. Any others or shall we, shall we press on? Pascal, next question. I think, no, I think we can press on. We It's already 10.30, so maybe we can press okay. on. And if the, most of the other comments are either agreeing with um, existing uh, questions or comments. So I think we can press on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, okay. yeah. Right. Well, let, well, let's. I want to approach this rather than going straight into the word of the ensemble. Come at it from the end of the scenario. Mark, let me just say one thing. So, oh, yeah. people, please keep asking your questions, and we'll. If you if we haven't come back to, it, we may we may come up with it later. Okay. okay. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Let's in this little segment. Let's just dip into this world of scenarios. Um, I think in one of the comments in the flyer was, you know, in the world of the ensemble, what's happened to scenarios. So I'll start with scenarios and root cause. And uh, I made the suggestion that actually, when if we go into the world of the ensemble, we need to sort of take the scenarios with us, which is uh, getting a little bit to Geary's point. Um, and I'd especially like to hang on to this, these words root cause, because that's just something I found very useful over the years. So multiple deterministic scenarios. I take Chris's point completely that there is no such thing as a model which is entirely stochastic or one that is entirely deterministic. Hence, the you know it is impossible to build a reservoir model without having both uh, components in there. So it's really a question of waiting. Do we go more towards the stochastic side or more to the deterministic side? So if you like to live more to the deterministic side, it, it is scenarios. And there's uh, got a definition of this which actually goes from back to Van der Heiden. Um, who did it in terms of corporate planning, uh, which I think went back to the 1960s, where the idea was, you, you know, you can plan better if you um, if you look at real world scenarios and that helps set the company on a certain direction. So he defined scenarios as a set of reasonably plausible but structurally different futures. And I quite like that structurally different futures, in which you do complete real world outcomes and uh, with Simon Smith. And so we took that and tried to apply that to the world of reservoir modeling, which has sort of got us into all this. So that's what the scenario is. It's inherently non-statistical. Absolutely. And that you just have to accept with this, this sort of approach, uh, which is potentially the weakness. So in other words, instead of doing this, instead of doing RM, very simple, really, you, you don't do it once, you do it lots of times. The, um, the debate comes on whether or not you have a preferred case in your set of scenarios. So this, uh, this goes back to Bart van der Leen put, put this paper together in 96, when really early days of scenarios. Uh, and the point was made there that actually the, and I think this is still true, that we do have to have a base case at the end, principally because, you know, we can only do one thing in the stage gate process. It's it's the bit where we do actually select and then go on to define. Uh, our problem um, when we is when we begin to close our minds too early, back to uh, Gabriel's point about keeping open minds. and that happens if we select the base case first, I think, because of all the problems of anchoring and our natural bias to stay too close to our initial anchor point and be pretty biased when the anchor goes down. Um, to pick up Daniel Kahneman's words, I don't think we can actually avoid that. It happens. We just it's human nature. So the only way the only way to, to avoid it, in a sense, is to just not do it. So don't do the base case up front, run with the sweep all the way through. That's the ideal. Where does it start? Well, it starts by putting, it's is Thomas's thing, you know, where do we start? We start by throwing it very broad on an organizational level and we, you know, we're trying to avoid the icebergs. So we start with the long list. 
and this is from a couple of recent courses with the thanks and uh, not that I asked if I could use these, but uh, the writing is very small uh, from one of the recent courses. This is long listing, which I think most companies do to some extent, whether you call it risk registers, uncertainty registers or, or whatever. Most companies are doing this now and you end up with a very long list. And it feels like a good starting point. The question is what you do with it, because as the list grows, you know, the iceberg can quite easily get lost. So we have this tension that we want to look broadly, but we don't want to sort of lose anything. So a suggested approach from scenarios is to do indeed do the long list, get everything out there, uh, check that they are indeed uncertainties and not just statements or choices, clean it up, um, work out where the overlaps are, and then say, okay, let's go from the long list and let's get it down to a short list. And this is an exercise in seeing the wood for the trees. Uh, and best done as, as a group, um, because if we work individually, we are, of course, horribly biased. Nothing we can do about that. Our best hope is to work as a group and do it uh, collectively. Go from a long list to a short list. And it's looking at everything on that list and saying, well, look, um, where are the dependencies? Are some of those things actually combined? If some of those things are combined, they can be treated together and we can build a scenario around a combination of things. The second one is this word sensitivity from the introduction. It's recognising that actually some of these uncertainties to be honest, they don't really significantly impact on the decision at hand. You might want to do a sensitivity analysis to so just confirm that, but it's quite a relief to put some things down and say, actually, do you know the prosty in this field? Well, we do know roughly what the prosty is. You know, if it's a conventional reservoir, once you've got a bit of data coming in, um, you, you don't have the answer. You don't definitely have an answer and you haven't nailed it completely, but I suspect you probably do have a fairly good idea what the prosty is if it's a simple situation. And then there's root cause. So which are the actual root causes which could cause the project to fail? Which are the things which could cause us to hit the iceberg? And this is the process of seeing the wood for the trees. And if you're not familiar with root cause analysis, um, it's, uh, it's favoured by health and safety. They sort of do it when there's been an accident. They sort of work down to what was the underlying root cause. And there's a thing called the five whys, which I can just share with you if you've not seen it before. It's very simple. You just keep asking why. Um, why did that happen? Why, 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 why? And the suggestion is by the time you've done it about five times, you're probably down to the underlying root cause. And the illustration I'll use, I'll give a car illustration. Uh, I got this from Richard Oxlade, a colleague from some of you may know from uh, his BP days. Um, and this is a real instance. This is Richard. He has a Land Rover or he had a Land Rover and driving from Aberdeen to Edinburgh, it broke down. I can always hear you say, I'm not surprised. But you say, OK, why did it break down? And the answer is it ran out of fuel. Now, what you can do at that point is then put more fuel in the car, but that's not solving the root cause. So you keep asking why. Why did it break down? And Richard would tell me that it's because his, his fuel gauge, his indicator doesn't work. His fuel gauge doesn't work. So you could just replace that one thing, but probably it will happen again. Why did your fuel gauge not work? Well, it's because I don't service my car. Why don't you service my car? Well, I, you know, I don't believe in routine maintenance. Well, that's your problem. It's not being short of petrol. Your problem is routine maintenance. That's the thing to address. That's the root cause. I think in this particular case, and this is my bias, but what I said to Richard, you know, the root cause was that you bought a Land Rover. You know, you really, you don't actually have to do that. You can just buy a car that works, but that's back to personal bias again. Although I think true, he has now bought uh, an Audi. So root cause analysis. It's getting below things like this, and I saw this come up in the chat. We have a hand, we have a tendency when we dive into uncertainty analysis to perhaps model the things that are easy to model with the software that we happen to have at hand, and and that's not a great place to be. I, I've done it myself. Uh, early resume modeling tools um, had had lots of lots of stuff about channels and width thickness ratios and sinuosity was one of the early things that we could do a lot with, and so I used it almost all the time. Only, only if there were channels, of course, but I, I spent a lot of time on that and relatively little time thinking about things like faults and are there sub seismic faults? Because I didn't have a technique for that. There wasn't the software couldn't do it. It was too tricky, but you can do that. Um, so if you come along and say, well, I'm uncertain about net to gross. Well, you may be, but you know, before diving in with the Gaussian description, um, Try the five whys. Why are you uncertain about net to gross? And so, well, you know, is it the petrophysicist? No, it's not that. Is it amount of data? And so, well, no, it's not that. It's that actually I've looked at the bit of core. It's a fluvial system. It might be a braided system and it might be meandered, and I don't know. 
that's the root cause. Net to gross isn't the root cause, it's the high level consequence. And the difference between those two pictures at the bottom um, is not a Gaussian situation. It's not most likely to be half braided. Yeah, it's going to tend to be one or the other. So that's what needs to go in there as an uncertainty if it impacts on the decision. That's a root cause. <clears throat> and the idea of actually putting some uncertainties down and saying, actually, this doesn't really affect on us, it's just something which we um, we need to get over, I think. Um, I, I had that with this back in Oman, back in Shell days, where we had the LNG scheme, which is the first time for me at least that we really tried this thing, tried the word of scenarios. Um, this is from the 96 paper. It's, a, it's just a spider chart showing how different things are impacting on, on the thing that, that the project was going to succeed or fail on, which was, which was CapEx in this case. Um, and it's actually, this was done for a conference. It's heavily exaggerated. Most of the lines in the middle were actually much flatter than that. That's what counted. So although we only had two wells on the structure, I was doing all sorts of things with channels and um, you know changing sizes, and it just made absolutely no difference whatsoever to the actual decision at hand. The thing that really counted was, is massive hydraulic fracturing going to work here? Because if it is, we can do half the number of wells. That was the root cause uncertainty, the efficiency of fracturing. And when we compared it with everything else, actually most of the other things, I mean, we didn't know that things like channels, we didn't really know, we only had two wells on one of the structures, but we did know that the net to gross was 80%, so we really weren't that bothered. And it was, it was, a, it was a pain for me at the time that the thing that the scheme rested on wasn't geology. Um, but on the other hand, well, fair enough. It's OK to say, I think, that some, some things are not that uncertain. So a case here um, is offshore. That's what I'm really saying here. Eight different, eight different things as a result of uh, doing one of these risk registers and breaking things down. Uh, even here, we got it down to eight. If we really let those all run and play with parameter variations on them all, we've got 256 combinations. But we don't really. We don't really. So we did the root cause thing here. Um, well, three things actually. Firstly, the sensitivity test. Secondly, the dependency test. And then thirdly, the root cause. And it turns out there aren't eight things here. And you can, just looking around those um, descriptions, you can probably see that already. There's actually really just three. Yeah, and a couple you can't, the sensitivities you'd have to actually do them to know. But in this particular case, you could do anything with the geophysics and anything with the rail perms within the range of reason. And it didn't make any difference to the decision at hand, which, which was a sanctioned decision. In terms of dependencies, there are things here that are completely related. Whether, you, whether the system is open or compartmentalized, and when you've got more than one fluid type, this, that's all a thing to do with compartments, the root cause of which is faulting in this case. Um, and then the other root cause here, well, net to gross wasn't an uncertainty, well, it is an uncertainty, but the root cause was sand distribution. So therefore, model sand distribution. So we don't have um, eight, we have one that's not root cause, we have the others which are dependent and some which we're not sensitive to. So actually, there's only really three things going and gone in here. That goes into that, that goes into that, and it's just injectivity, which is the true independent parameter uh, compared to those other uncertainties. That then goes on to something simple like a scenario tree, and we can go off and make models. Even then, we don't even need to make them all. We can just take the very best one and the very worst one and then see if it affects the decision. If we're if it's green lights in both cases, then we know we're on the way to a decision. We probably would check the others just to be sure. So that's scenarios. We sketch them, uh, and this is the underlying concept to make sure that we, we, we are agreeing with each other. Let's make sure we actually know uh, when someone says they have an answer. The words can often be vague. Uh, a drawing, a sketch, is is much more, is much less forgiving. It's it completely shows what's in someone's head, and often the, the act of sketching itself um, exposes a thought, which is which perhaps wasn't coming through in words. So I'm a big fan of sketching. So you sketch them all out. Um, this is one we were doing at the university the other week for some modelling on heterogeneity. Uh, just sketch. When we started this by each of us doing sketches, combining them on a mirror, we use the mirror board. There's a bunch of ways of doing that just now if you're remote. And then we start rationalizing it. And once you actually drew it, of course, personally, you have your own realization when you realize it's harder to draw than you thought. You think, well, what actually does go on up there and over here and up there? What does it actually look like? Am I worried about that? Once it's drawn, it's very inclusive. Um, and someone else can then get a pencil and say, it's not like that. And 
the conversation can move on. So a second case to illustrate that as we head up to the second stopping point. Um, this is one uh, same approach, uh, but uh, obviously it was in the desert rather than offshore. That was the clue. Same thing. Long list of uncertainties, but then break it down. Some of them not root cause. Some of them the decision was insensitive to that particular issue. When you just get the root cause uncertainties, there were four in this case. Out of that, you could key off some scenarios, start sketching. One of them was where does the sand come from? Turned out could have come from the northeast, the south, or um, actually I can't even remember what the left what left hand one was now. But basically, we just drew them and, and got whatever knowledge was available, pack as much knowledge into the room, give everyone the pen, give everyone a base map and just say, start drawing. What do you think? And then you talk it through. And in this particular case, a bunch of models were made, scenarios, deterministic ones. And we just looked at the uncertainty in the volume distribution in terms of variance. So it's just a map here. This The decision here was where do we drill appraisal wells to reduce the dynamic range in, in place volumes. Uh, and what you've got there, we knew where the contact was, which is why it goes to zero at the edge here. That was that was well defined. It was where the sand was inside the container. And, and this essentially was just a simple way of revealing that, you know, well, here, 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 here. And then the company spent the next four, the next year uh, drilling those four locations. So that scenario is if you really lived at the apex, you might just maybe have four cases. You can do the sensitivities around that if you wish, and that's taken us back towards the middle of the triangle. And I suppose the question for us, and this is the question I'd leave as we go into the second little break, um, you know, are we missing anything or is that enough? We haven't really got into the world of the ensemble, although in a sense we're beginning to build one here. Um, is this enough or is there something here that we're missing? Is there some extra tool that we need that can do better? And that's the open question for you. So I'll pass you back to uh, Pascal and Chris. OK, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, I would like to start with um, one question from uh, before. I think just before this, you started this new session. Uh, I'd like to call on uh, Daniel. Daniel Soldian. If you can uh, phrase your question a bit, the question where you talked about world of uh, force of falsifiability or something like that. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, it's not really a question as such, but 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 I think uh, the big issue is uh, that we have a tendency, and and many companies have, um, you have to defend what you believe or your best guess if you like that's inherent in in your in the uh, call to control <laughs> processes that you have uh, mm -hmm. but but i think what you really at least ideally want is uh, a world where falsifiability is at the core so so it's okay could this be happening on, uh, on our field mm -hmm. um and if there is a remote chance that this is this could happen you have to include it, uh, mm. but of course that is extremely idealistic uh, because that's where both time and your tools limit you, because it is very difficult to uh, to model all those. Uh, and I would also add that, of course, um, I like the concept of uh, root cause analysis a lot, uh, but often uh, or early in, in uh, a field's life, maybe what would be the root cause isn't showing in your data ah. so you would you would actually have to i think we also uh have a tendency to be too to narrow-minded in the sense that you need to look at a broader uh, set of uh data not just from for, from the field at hand but but maybe all the fields that could be uh, could look like yours yeah, and that, thank you for using the word field because uh, one of the best ways and it, it's tantalizing because we can't do it at the moment, but is is to actually get out in the field and stand in front of a reasonable analog. We've, we've done that with groups, Norwegian group actually before um before a stage gate, uh, when just before you know when there's still time to change your mind and, and went to stand in front of a potential analog and you, and that was quite a sobering moment to just look in front of it and say, hmm, could that be it? <laughs> and it does. There is something about expanding the mind. I'm going back to, I liked what Giri said right at the beginning. It's getting you, putting yourself into a situation that opens your mind to possibilities. But without being too extreme, which is the hard one, Daniel, you, you mentioned, you know, if it's plausible, it should be in there. 
it's it's that hard thing, isn't it? Of how extreme do you go? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I'd like uh, Chris, to pick. Chris, there's someone raising his hand, uh, so maybe he can jump in. Uh, I think that's uh, Peter Michael Swiss or something like that. Yeah, Michael Peter Swiss. Uh, thank you, um, Mark. Um, what I'm missing and was also kind of popping up in the in in in, in the chat uh, was you kind of left out on how you kind of defined your deterministic cases here. Mm. Um, I mean, there is no a priori knowledge on what is the root cause. I mean, you have been nicely explaining to us the example of your car. Obviously, the car broke down, so the search for the root cause was after the fatality, so to say. Mm. Now, we have to talk about things which are the future, which are mm. pot potential future fatalities, so we are in a completely different situation. Yeah. Uh, so how do you consider that? I mean, is it an ad hoc knowledge that you apply to find your deterministic scenarios uh, based on your brains, on your guts, or on what? Or is it that you have to carefully test out what is for your specific reservoir, which you know to a certain extent, which has a high uncertainty, which you may describe with, uh, with, with some stochastic information or something else, but any, however you like to describe it, you have to test it to find out. And my understanding is that the typical way to find out what is kind of significant for my problem would be a sensitivity analysis to do first. Mm -hmm. So systematic approach over the whole possibilities that exist. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking here about st structurally different. I, I think whether something is structurally different or not, this is sometimes interpretative and only for convenience. Sometimes we have classes. Honestly, in, in many cases, geology is very fluent. Yeah? You say, well, we have braided river and meandering river systems, and there's hardly anything between. Well, that's not my personal experience. Actually, frequently I see them side by side. I see transitions in between, and logically, in, in the sediment logical scenario, you know that through time these systems are changing, and they, they are certainly transitions in between. So honestly, I, I don't see that there is such a need for classifications here a priori when it comes to uncertainty, because we know that that a priori, we cannot say that there is just specific end members. Uh, mm. that, that's my view on the thing. So maybe explain to us how did you decide on your cases and relationships in your example? Yeah, I mean, it's a nice, it's an important point. Actually, I'd almost like to bounce it back to the group because I bet this is, we all think about this, don't we? We all think about this when, we, when we're defining how, how far do we stretch things. Um, yeah, well, let, 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 so <clears throat> let's be prepared to open that one up to the group. So if anyone's got any sort of ways of answering that, please put a, put a hand up. What, the only thing I could suggest is that, to be honest, the way it was done was engineering best judgment. And the, um, then it was a question of getting the right people in the room. So for the case of the one in the desert, we literally just went and found people who worked on this field or worked in the area or the region. And when we did that sketching thing, it wasn't me and my best friend, reservoir engineer. It was it was it was about seven or eight people, which I think had three or four hundred years of experience. And we thought, you know, have we got it yet? And because there's always that chance, isn't there, that you still get it wrong. But I thought, well, at least we've at least we've minimized the risk of that by getting the experience in the room. But, yeah, someone, but like, someone, someone wrote in the chat uh, is to use the analogs and experience, which is essentially what uh, Mark is suggesting. Yeah, so yeah. there are analog, lot of analog fields uh, out there, uh, and in many cases, uh, quite a lot of people have experience uh, related to different fields across uh, different companies, which you can tap into if you really want to. I mean, stretch the range of what you think is uh, yeah. feasible. Yeah. And I'll, I'll take Michael's uh, point as well that, you know, about something being a little bit systematic when you've got the list. Um, and while we've got this on the screen at the moment, you know, if you've got that red scenario there and you've begun to do some sensitivities just to check, you know, how much noise is there around that. If you do that and the red noise is there, um, 
then we need to go back and think about these how these scenarios are defined. Because it's suggesting that actually the dynamic range within that one case is really wide, in which case, back to the beginning, go around again. Why is the range? What's, what's the root cause driving that particular range? If you can. Okay, just, just uh, Mark, sorry to interrupt. I just want to move on to another. We've got two or three minutes left of this little session, but Oliver, I think, had a quite an important uh, comment here. Mm -hmm. Oliver Torres, do you want to come back to what your comment was and explain it? Is he there? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Hi, hi, Mark. Hi. Uh, very nice presentation. Um, uh, I think um, uh, it's clear that we have gone from base case to, to stochastic probably too quick. And uh, um, as uh, companies realize that uh, that stochastic it will not cover deterministic scenarios. So what we're trying to do now is to create different deterministic scenarios and add the probability on there using a stochastic uh, tools to keep that to keep the heterogeneity that we observe in core and in logs. Uh, that we normally lose when to do deterministic cases. So uh, I, I see that we have gone from our base case to something middle between stochastic and deterministic. Mm -hmm. And stochastic can mean a lot of things because it's within the probabilistic framework. It can be just noise or it can be a geological trend with noise. So mm -hmm. the thing is, if you have a geological trend, that's deterministic. You can have different geological trends with those noise to cover a cloud. And the question here is how how this cloud it will be, it will be uh, and how much that will impact when contrast to another data. And when we build a green model, we don't have dynamic data, but when we have a mature model, we have dynamic. So here is the, the, the point, how much do we go on prob on probabilistic or deterministic yeah. having having uh, dynamic data uh, to mm. try to narrow that narrow that uh, spectrum? Yeah, I think Nick was making a similar point. Actually, we haven't we haven't talked haven't talked we haven't introduced dynamic data in here at all yet, which is where we need to go. Into. I uh, will we'll take one more question, um, and I guess uh, I can pick Ankesh, Anupam, Anup Anupam, sorry for that. He had a question about root cause analysis. Michael, can you mute, please? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Good fast typing. No, I, I had Hello. a question, uh, uh, Mark. Um, it goes back to the title of the webinar, basically. You, you talk about, are ensemble really the solution? And we talk about multiple deterministic, deterministic and stochastic. And I'm just wondering if you could say in your mind, I, I work a lot with uh, ensembles these days, uh, what, how do you make the distinction because what, what do you see the difference being of an ensemble? What does separate that from at what point can you call it an ensemble or an Monte Carlo? And is it necessarily, is it a mathematical approach of averaging or does one necessarily rule out the point fact that you can actually introduce some other than creating a pixel based yep. approaches? I think that's a nice thing. You know, we we can because there are camps. Different camps have evolved around the world of ensembles, um, or non ensembles. If when I'm looking at what's on the screen there, you know, actually, is that an ensemble? Do we call that an ensemble? And uh, I'm, I'd, I'd like to finish with that one actually. Trying to uh, right at the back end, um, maybe we should be a bit more gentle with ourselves on the on how we're using the word ensemble. Okay, let's, let's come back to that. Uh, Mark, since you will come back to that, can you, maybe we just quickly take uh, uh, the question from uh, Ankesh. He was just about to speak before Tron. Oh. Hello. Hi. So, yeah, root cause analysis, and I find it very interesting. But um, 
and uh, the whole uh, whole idea that uh, you go from a long list to a short list and uh, this is this is really um, a good idea because you have a lot of a lot of uncertainties in your field and that can actually make it a feasible way to in order to analyze your uncertain variables mm -hmm. but uh, what what i see that when you are looking at a root cause analysis a lot of analysis is, is seems like it's a more subjective and experience based which can introduce a lot of bias in how you are looking to it yeah. So and that personal bias, I think it is one of the biggest challenges is uh, which we face when we are looking in this uncertainty domain. So how do you think that uh, we can we can use this analysis and avoid the bias? So well, that's that's a very good question. And I mean, my only suggestion I, I'm going and I'll go back to Daniel Kahneman, my hero here. Um, he says uh, basically or he makes the argument indirectly for pyrrhicist. Now a lot of us, a lot of folk hate peer assists because it's, you know, it's being judged. It's being uh, people asking you to do things again. All sorts of things we don't like. I, I having read Carmen's Carmen Antovsky's material, I, I now see peer assists as being an exercise in debiasing, and that that's a much friendlier thing to do. It's basically people trying to save the project. Um, so I, I think it involves other people. It involves getting. And there's comments in here about involving analogs and taking Michael made the comment about global uncertainties. Absolutely. So is having someone in the room who can bring a bit of global uh, bit of global perspective and keep things open. I think that's the best way. Back to corporations again. Yeah, collaboration is the key. Yep. Yeah, that's it. OK, I think you can carry on then. Thank you. All right, should we go on? Do we need a do we need a five minute comfort break or shall we press on? We're on the press app. on. No, press <laughs> on because I think the, 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 yeah, pe people can people can go out if they want. We'll just press on, I think. Yes, we don't need to go into details, do they? People can look after no. their own needs. OK, let's okay. press on. OK, well, the question is, and there, there are some issues there, and the, the very nice series of questions, actually. There, there was a bunch of issues surrounding that. So the question is, then, if we take something, um, a robust statistical procedure, which is sort of what the heart of ensembles, as it was presented to me first, a bit of Bayesian thinking, <coughs> does this help address um, some of those issues that have come up in the chat. And if we, uh, the cartoon version of a simple version of that is you go in with your concepts and now we make a whole pile of models, um, usually considered to be equally probable. And then out of that, we can get a statistical response and it puts us down in the far left hand corner. Now, what I'd like to do, uh, I say this cautiously, I'm going to show an extremely naive um, application of this, uh, but done with a reason. Um, because people like me, general practitioners, do pick this up and use these tools rather naively to start with. And then we'll get into some of the sort of much deeper things. So here's an example. Um, we're in, oh, sorry, there's an, there's an, in any type of reservoir modeling software. So you, you put some inputs in, learn it to gross. You learn it to gross sequence. You've got a couple of wells. The channel sands, some channel sands have been seen in these wells. And the seismic is giving us a rough indication which way they go. That's what we know. But we don't know where the sand is. So we can go in and we can make alternative realizations. Yeah. And therefore, we're handling the uncertainty. Yes or no? I mean, we sort of are because that honors the input data and it explores the thing we don't know, which is where the sands are. We just you don't know where they are. So we've made a bunch of models using stochastic seeds, true stochastic models in this case, random seeds, and we move the channels around. Therefore, we've handled the uncertainty. Well, yes, and then again, no. Um, so if you if you do something like back out a probability map from a number of runs, let's take 25 realizations. So it's not statistical, it's a reasonable number. And we can see a channel belt there, and we can see the probability of hitting sands across those 25 models, and it gets us up to about 30, just over 30%, and some, as you'd expect, some uh, bullseyes appearing around the well. Then we keep going, because that's not enough. Let's do 100. So we do 100 realizations, and now it's really getting quite smooth. And um, for those of you who are close to reservoir modeling and uh, uh, the likes of Chris and Pascal, of course, what we're doing here, we're ending up with the creaged, um, the creaged results if you just took those two wells. In fact, what, we sh what we've got here on the probability map, what we can say from that is that, um, well, we can say it's a low net to gross. Some channel sands are seen in the wells, and the channels go roughly northeast, southwest. So what we've done here, we've used the stochastic process essentially to give us back our input data. And I did this is my what I did first with stochastic modeling. And I thought I've just all I've done is all I've done is got my input data back. 
And if I go to my favorite geostatistician is Michael Perch out at UT um, in um, San Antonio, can't remember now. Anyway, in Texas, as you can tell by the T-shirt. This is from, from the book, the second edition of Clayton Deutsch's book, which Michael put, put together with, uh, with Clayton. Geostatistical methods aim to reproduce the input data. They have no predictive power with respect to those statistics. Now, <clears throat> it is basically stochastic. It's Greek, isn't it? Stochas, I think Phil told me that. You know, if you look up the definitions of stochastic, it, it will have the word random in there. There's something random in there. It's just how we use it. Now, in the particular case I've just shown you was a piece of work which actually got achieved really nothing, to be honest. It appeared to be handling uncertainty, but it wasn't, not really. All it was doing is giving back the input data, which is in fact how we QC these things. That's how you QC a multiple stochastic data set. Um, so when you take that and start putting data on it, um, production data was mentioned before, and we start doing things like automatic history matching, it can quite quickly get quite complicated and and it can also look quite impressive. Um, and I think it genuinely is quite impressive. This is based on, well, we're not using software, it's one of the earlier um, predictive methods. Uh, so these are now production forecasts um, with, with some automatic history matching building. We've got a swathe of forecasts um, and we can pick off our P50, our P10, and P90. And this feels good. This feels like statistics. Um, we've got a lot of cases, we can analyze them. And if it's done well, and it can be done well. You know, we have, and you hear the, you're familiar with the term exhaustive exploration of uncertainty space. On a good day, you have exhaustively explored uncertainty space. Um, on a bad day, of course, we just found a way of being wrong 5,000 times instead of the traditional once with our base case model. And then reality comes in and it's down here and we hit an iceberg. So the question we aren't address ourselves is have we moved ourselves forward by putting this amount of rigor uh, into it? So case three, let's have a little look. And uh, this is um, a sh some shared experiences. It's a picture of the a globe because I don't want to pick one example. This is there's a couple which I've been very close to, but there's a couple that have come out in training courses which other people have shared, and um, the observations were fairly common. So um, we have an ensemble of forecasts now. <coughs> um, no fun to QC. Actually, it is quite good fun to QC, but it's not it's not easy to QC. Uh, so this is all cumulative production uh, from a, from a statistical ensemble with lots of cases. Um, uh, in fact, the re this, this is a redraw from the original where there was about 500 cases, which I think you can argue is still not enough, but at least it's, it's certainly a lot. And the way this was analyzed, uh, we were asked to join in here because um, the group doing this had lost a certain amount of confidence and, the, and they were QCing it by picking off a high and a low case. And of course, what they noticed as, as those of you who have done this, you'll be familiar with what happens down here. You can pick the P89 and the P91, and they're structurally completely different. And then you have the quandary, well, you know, which one should we select? And you can go into clustering techniques to do that. Jeff Kares and the others illustrated some nice clustering techniques. But you rub against this issue that you've generated. It's a bit like that comment that, you know, the uh, different routes can, can give you the same outcome. That's essentially what's happening here. And you think, well, OK, can I take that? Is it really a P90? And you know the answer is well. To be honest, not really. Um, it's the P90 with respect to this set of statistics and a certain series of boundary conditions and a certain series of assumptions. But that's not the same as saying it's a P90 for what's in the subsurface. Um, and we can unfortunately never prove that, of course, because we never get to see the subsurface. So taking Michael's point and extrapolating it, we just don't get to check it with the, against the truth case. So we will never know. So what do we do with this? Um, well, uh, if I can go back to one that I was involved in, um, an early one, or I'd like to say I did it wrong. Um, I generated the same thing that was noticed in that case and also in ones that come up on training courses that at the end of an ensemble, um, you ended up um, with these with very low P10, P90 ratios. There's maybe different costs attached to them, but the actual uncertainty range can often be quite narrow. And what was happening in the case in, that I worked on was that we we did a series of scenarios and then we began to add more cases and bring in the second and third order uncertainties. And we did it to be rigorous and to show that we were doing a good job. But a lot of the cases we were adding were actually not so, they were very sort of center weighted. And because we were assuming equal probability, what was happening is we were adding more cases and adding more uncertainty. We thought we we're adding uncertainty, 
we're actually steeping in the curve and increasing the proven volumes. And it was something that was hanging on critical number of proven volumes to get an investment, which was not at all what we intended. We were trying to add uncertainties to spread the range. Um, now, the statisticians among you are probably weeping at this point um, because, of course, this is not the thing to do. Uh, but it was the same in that much more complicated ensemble that I was referring to. Uh, what you can end up doing, or what we realized was happening in a couple of cases, is that the group were essentially discovering central limit theory. And um, the way they're set up, the, the, the ensemble, basically one part of the model was compensated for another in terms, you know, it's quite, it was quite a complicated thing they'd done. And they're all ending up with roughly the right, roughly the same number, different costs, but roughly the same number. So they were actually collapsing the uncertainty range, not expanding it. They were exploring it, but then collapsing it. And for black belt ensemble people there, you, I think it'd be nice to hear your tricks and tips actually to share with the general community because there, there are ways of avoiding this. Um, I go back to this one, which is, this is FORCE, four years ago. So thank you, FORCE. I'm not supposed to mention company names, but I think everyone knows where this comes from. I thought this was absolutely brilliant. When I saw it, the, the thing I really liked was the gravestone saying RIP base case. Uh, so good start. In principle, this is what we're trying to do, isn't it? The, we, we, we said we can't do this on the left because, you know, it's, it's, um, it's outrageous really that we'll make multi-million dollar decisions based on that guess. So yeah, why not, why not do an ensemble that cover the whole range? The nice thing about this is it introduces the metaphor of the dartboard and we can have a lot of fun with that. You know, forecasting, you know, what we promised, we really did say it was our technical best, we were going to hit the bullseye. Um, what we hoped for is that we could have a little portfolio and perhaps we'd not only hit the bullseye, maybe we'll get, you know, treble, treble 20. Um, it's just that with some of our portfolios, we ended up with treble one instead, so that wasn't so good. And, and of course, there's, well, to be honest, if you are in that situation there, I think there comes a point where you just have to say that you're fundamentally in the wrong job. Maybe try a different career, something that doesn't involve hitting the target at all. More seriously, our problem, um, our problem here is that, you know, if only we knew where the dartboard was, this would really be possible. Our problem is the dartboard is buried two or three kilometers underground. So when we throw an ensemble at it, the tough thing here is that the whole ensemble can be skewed. And that's that's the risk. That's what we have to try and avoid. Um, it's much harder when you can't see the dartboard. So you may think we're doing this, but often we end up doing this, or in fact, we end up realizing our darts are fairly close and the real world is, is out here and is a much bigger place, which comes back to that initial thing of needing to keep it open. So is the ensemble a normal automatic solution to this problem? Not at all, but, but can it can it help us? I think it can, but there's some things we need to consider. So if, if I do the pros and cons here, like we did for the base case, the, the advantage of this, these kind of techniques is that we are using impartial statistics and there's a feeling that that then helps debiases because it's sort of rigorous. It's that thing that Mike sent, Michael mentioned, you know, it, it's systematic. Um, you can run a lot of cases and that feels good because we're certainly exploring uncertainty space. And if we do it well, it doesn't have to be base case led. It doesn't have, I've heard cases where people have gone into these ensembles and when they really dig in there, there was actually only one case underneath with a lot of noise on top of it. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. They can be base case, they, can, they don't have to be base case led. A disadvantage is that it can look like a black box. And for folk who not like these techniques, that this is often the complaint. They, they look at the ensemble and then they can't see through to the underlying concepts which were driving it. So it requires a lot more effort to see what's gone in, what's gone into that. When we talk P90, P10, it does rely on this idea of equal probability. Um, it is unprovable. Because the dartboard is two or three kilometers underground, we don't have, there isn't, there isn't a statistical tool which will tell us whether we have the right sample, whether we've made the right runs. We just don't have it. We can't prove equal probability, which means the P90, you know, there's no such thing as a P90 channel, I often like to say. The, it's P90 with respect to those statistics, but you have no way of knowing whether those statistics are covering the dartboard. Um, another thing that's often said is that the link between each of these cases and real world outcomes can be a little bit unclear. Sometimes it is base case led. Sometimes it is base case led. So, what are we going to do about ensembles? Well, if I can put this out here, this is a, to really open up open up questions. 
As far as I can see, we've got three choices as practitioners. One of them is to say, OK, we're going to do ensembles, um, but I'm going to get my scenario based thinking in here. In, for, in the form of the input parameters, and that's that's a bold initiative. It's quite difficult, but you can do it. You can do it. You can you can have your root causes sorted out and you can get them in here uh, so that they then get picked up by the exhausted number of runs. That's one way of approaching it. A second one. We can say, OK, this tool is a tool for generating sensitivities around key scenario based uncertainties along the lines of root cause. So effectively that diagram I had before. Third option, <clears throat> the harsh one, um, is we can just say don't do it if you don't feel it's adding value. What I would like to toss in as we go into the next break, um, I think if you really do like statistical techniques and are reeling to the idea of not doing this, well, let's turn around and up the ante. We can let's let's go even further. Uh, let's take space and thinking to push it further because we can do that as well, and it takes us into an interesting space. And I just want to go here briefly because I want to come back to it right at the end. And um, I'm guessing some of you are familiar with this kind of stuff. I mean, we've been, when we're talking uh, ensembles generally, it's ensemble carbon filter, it's this. So it's, it's one of the um, pictures from um, Equinor. I am going to mention that because thank you, because uh, we just got the permission to put it in the new book, which is, uh, that's my advert, by the way, which is coming out very shortly. Um, so thank you very much for, for sharing this. This is essentially it, and a couple of nice things in here. We're seeing the this is the update for for posterior for additional data, which is where our production data can come in to give a prior distribution and turn it to a narrow posterior. If you know all this, you know all this. If you don't, this wasn't really supposed to be what the talk was about today, but um, that's the general idea. And you get into these iteration loops here using sort of Bayesian update framework. What I really like about this is the uh, is this one here. It's that extra loop at the bottom that says actually conceptual loop for human learning and I thought that was really really neat because then absolutely the crux for doing these things well but we can go even further <clears throat> beyond the ensemble Kalman filter um, if you've been following the geoscience and geoenergy webinar series which uh, is one of the big successes of our lockdown world that um, uh, my colleague uh, Sebastian Geiger at uh, Eric Watts and his, his friend and colleague Hadi had your baby from Delft. They set this up a year, just over a year ago, and every week they got someone to come and give a talk. And they've, they've, they must they tell you they're very well networked because <laughs> they've had they had a tremendous bunch of speakers. And Jeff Kears turned up back in October the 22nd, and I'm highlighting it because this is on their YouTube channel and everything's uh, watchable. Um, worth having a look at that. And he he introduced this thing called Bayesian Evidential Learning. And again, I'm not going to go into it in detail because I can't. I bought the book. I could do that. And I understand bits. And it's an expensive book. So, you know, it's basically the Stanford group. And uh, what they've what they point out, um, and I would encourage you to watch his talk, actually, because it's not it does head into deep statistics, but he's really good at the beginning. He said it's partly it's the statistics, but partly it's the principle of what we're trying to do. And that I must have been I rather liked. And he this is from the, just a screen grab. Um, from the steps in Bayesian learning, evidential learning. So the idea, when you, there's a lot of statistical sort of expressions in here, but if you dig into them, decision question, parameters, that's the long list or the short list, uncertainty reduction, that's indeed going to the short list. I just thought there's an awful lot of parallels in here with the workflows that we've already sort of summarised them. Um, and then he flashed this up and I thought, OK, that's it, that's the long list. So it's taking this long list and then starting to do statistics on it. But what they come up with, and this is the last slide before the break, and I thought this was really neat. He said, look, there's, it's another triangle, but uh, there's data and there's our model and there's a forecast. And what we do, IRM, the standard IRM approach, we take our data, we build a model and then we iterate backwards and forwards and then we forward model and you get a forecast. And if you're making a, an ensemble, potentially you do it many times. And uh, the argument here was that actually based on evidential learning, the idea, the idea is that um, you don't go through this forward modeling matching bit against production data. Uh, what you do, you generate your ensemble over here. Gosh, that's a long question. How are you reading, Pascal? You start with a, with, uh, with a suite of models, so you do need some data to get you going. Uh, generate them and then compare them with the data and you compare them with the forecast and you start to make a statistical relationship here between the data and the forecast. So what they're, they're arguing for broadly <coughs> is comparing with history but not matching it for an ensemble. 
and I thought that was really quite neat, uh, partly because it's sidestepping one of the tricky issues, which is large data sets and production data sets, which we're the, we have to do history matching on. And if you've got 100 wells, you know, that's a lot of work. If we do automatic history matching, that's a lot of QC, and it's, it's, there, there are issues. And they're basically here just saying, well, don't do it. You know, the, 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 the moment of, of uh, knowledge is when you see the mismatches and you devise a relationship between the data and the forecast. So I'll just put that one out there. But um, you can indeed go further in the near ensemble common filter if you're liking that kind of approach. So it's really a question for you or a thought for you as we head into the last break. Which one would you do? One, two, three or four? Pascal, Chris, back to you. Thanks, Mark. Um, the, the long, uh, the long chat you saw there wasn't really a question; it was a comment or some kind of uh, thoughts uh, from uh, Bjorn Egil. Okay. So, yeah. I'll read that while you go on to the question. Uh, Chris, do you have any? Um, if anyone has any um, burning interest, as you can uh, raise your hands, and then maybe we can pick it up as well. We Bjorn's question. Come on. Yeah. Are we inviting Bjorn Egil to comment on his comment? He could if he wants to, yes. Bjorn Egil? Uh, yes, hello. Um, comment on my comment. <laughs> <laughs> explain, your, explain your comment. I was telling you when you say after 20 years you haven't been able to de-bias anyone. <laughs> oh, it was first funny because I was writing that comment. <laughs> and then I removed it and then you started to talk about it. <laughs> Just, just what I was trying to write. I think the, I, I've been uh, working on uncertainty assessment and, and also discussions around it for at least 20 years. And it seems like we are, we are not going anywhere. It, these are the same discussions we've had all the time. And mm -hmm. then there are just some new discussions on software and methods of how to do it. But the fundamental issue, I think, is still human bias. Uh, it's just it's just very hard to get people to step out of their box, and that's just the fundamentals of, of probability that uh, you need to include P1 and P99. And if people say that these are impossible values, we, we don't believe in them. <laughs> but but that that is the idea, right? Yes. Call something P99, you don't believe in it. You just believe in it if it's P50 and you can accept P60, P40, but outside of that, it's very hard to include. And and um, so I just, I went to a course with uh, Jeff Sears here a, a couple of years ago, and I, I, I really liked this idea about uh, just starting completely from scratch with a rectangular box, really. Mm. And then ask yourself, okay, what has been proven? And you, you make some constraints on, on the seismic, you know, on depth and so forth, but you start very coarse and then you add wells and you add data more and more. So that's the base evidential learning thinking. Mm. Uh, but then the methods you use, I'm not sure about, but, but still that, that thinking, if we can all do that up front in, in, a, in a kickoff meeting, I think that's a good way of de-biasing. So you think about data in, in, in a way of what has been proven or not. I'd agree with that. But surely the problem here I see is people say, this is a fact, this is known. And then actually you yeah. drill a well or something and it's not known. It's, it, it's, no. what, and it's what people it, and make these big assumptions on for many years. I'll give you one case, that was Orman Langer and they had a DHI defining the field and then they drilled a well in the north and they found water at the top of the field where they mm. should have found gas and everyone believed yeah. this line about the out, outside of the field yeah but if you only include in the model what has been proven it's impossible to go outside yeah, yeah but uh, but the, even the things that are supposed to be proven sometimes have uncertainties to them that's the problem yeah and, and yeah, people it's, say it's not, that the, the, people, the terms people say they're proven, proven and they're not supposed to be proven is not really a term either it's proven or not but yeah i, I agree of course that then that's back to human bias again uh, mm. so even a problem with the proven uh, term 
that's okay, I'll... that's what that's all of us. It's it's impossible for us to throw away the bias. Okay, I'll pick one more question uh, from Daniel. Daniel Fitzsimmons. Hi, hi there, Mark. Um, yeah, you, 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 uh, you're a bit far away from your mic, Daniel. Yeah, there, there was a, there was a quote earlier about um, stochastic models not being predictive. So, um, so obviously, for a sand prediction, you know, if you're drilling a well in a low net system, this is certainly true. Um, could you comment on the stochastic model's predictive nature in terms of predicting ultimate recovery for, say, a, a given well count? Yes, I mean that's a different thing, isn't it? The I think the the Michael Perch comment is just saying that the geostats when it's the algorithm when it's creating heterogeneity is is replicating the input data. That's all it's really saying. It's, it's just that we you know those the algorithms of course were written to create heterogeneity, and in a sense we're taking the same types of algorithms and now applying them to uncertainty, and that's a different game. And that, that, that's 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 what he's pointing out. So no, we do we do make forecasts, but then I think it comes back to all of these things which have just been said. You know. What's what's defining what's defining the parameter range, which is stimulating the the, the spread. Um, that that that's that's the most important thing for sh for sure. And sometimes we can get at it with an ensemble, but on the illustrations I was just making, sometimes it doesn't go quite how we want, and we ended up we end up using an ensemble through a very complex series of steps and end up collapsing, which is exactly what we're probably not intending to do. Um, I don't know if that's really an answer. I, you, you can make reasonable ranges. It's just a question of how you define the input data, I think. I think. I, okay. I do. Yeah, so, so it's not, not a brilliant answer, is it? But <laughs> or do you have any? What's your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, um, yeah, I, I think obviously in, in sort of like the channelized system, your, you know, your, your predictions will be for a, a, a number of uh, your stochastic realizations will. will are plausible, but you, you know, your deterministic one is probably wrong. You know, <laughs> but yeah. so, but again, it's the, it's the definition of your determinism, as we say. So you, and then you need to basically, uh, you know, you're varying the the net to gross, the orientation, and the the, the, arch the architecture, the connectivity. That these are all these are all deterministic inputs to that stochastic model. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, but, you get but, but yeah. So. And it's coming out to Chris's point, actually, you know, a stochastic model has deterministic input. It doesn't appear from, you know, the, um, it's not 2001 a space, obviously. It's not a sentient, it's not artificial intelligence. The, the, these of software packages are not sentient. You know, it's, it's come from us ultimately. So everything is blending determinism mm -hmm. and uh, stochastics. I would, before we go on, I just like that comment from Martin, actually. It's nice that so much is coming up on bias, actually. Another way to de bias, instead of five people working one year, when you have five teams of five work ten weeks completely independently, then gather the estimates. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, that, would be, that would be the right way, but not very practical in the companies. <laughs> ah, well, there's the challenge. Challenge for team leaders: find a way of, of, of essentially doing that. Um, okay, well, we'll Ma that Michael Peter Swiss, I see your hand has been up for quite a while. Um, go ahead. Whoops, yeah, <laughs> always some clicking to turn on the mic <laughs> and then you click and you don't know whether you clicked or not. Anyway, so that's that's uncertainty and, and certainly something to do with risk if you handle it wrong. Um, <clears throat> now some comments, first of all, um, on the averaging part and to statistics, <clears throat> obviously heterogeneity has a tremendous impact on the dynamic yeah. response and the, the dynamic response of a system might not be linear. Yeah. So if if you have your sample of your channels with varying directions, depending on your injected producer pairs, you might get into full uh, full full uh, connection between those or full blocking, depending on your uncertainty. So learn you can learn a lot, and that's that's very much what what is important for for Jeff. Yeah. So Jeff cares very much turns on to understanding the spatial the spatial dependency of of dynamic responses always looking for the dynamic responses not only for the pure volumetric effect because pure volumetric effects are 
kind of always quite difficult and boring and they do not answer our problem. And here we come to the next point, which is which is very important that we have a proper definition of our initial problem. So we have to design our our experience. We have to design our models and our schemes in a way that we address our initial uh, problem. And in many cases, what people do when they build models, they build models because they're told to build models without knowing the problem. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like the problem is known ad hoc from the very beginning. Sometimes the problem changes over the course of your project. Yeah. So initially, maybe you didn't think that that you had a problem with the positioning of your producer injective pairs, but suddenly it pops up. Yeah. Um, Michael, Peter, if you if you can just make your if you, I mean make it a very direct question, make it short so, so well, we can entertain other people as well. Well, this is this is this was my comment towards uh, uh, the need for for multiple realizations and the need for the question <coughs> to Mark. Do you do yeah. you, how do you cover that in a multi deterministic world? Uh, um, in the interest of sorry, sorry, Michael, I need to butt in and chop you off there. Um, but in the interest of time, we've got we've got half we've got less than half an hour left for, left, left for the last part. And I'd like to move on because we want to have a little summary at the end and just leave two minutes for that. So can we move on to part four, please, Mark? Yeah, and uh, I'm very sympathetic to a lot of what Michael's saying there. So uh, let, let's let's weave that in as we go, Michael, and we'll see where we end up. OK, uh, this is just going to be a case. So it's just a case to think over, really, um, and also to think what we mean by the and then whether we've got techniques here which can help us achieve some of the things that you're sort of asking. I do also take the point that it's been yeah, 20 years ago, yes, we were talking about exactly the same things. Um, so somehow refreshing our approach, anything that refreshes our approach feels good, which is why I kind of like the stuff from Stanford, what that's coming out there. I like, I don't, the statistics I can't follow, but the, the principle of it I really like. Um, anything, anything that stretches our mind has got to be a good thing, and it takes us to the theme of modeling for understanding rather than necessarily specific solutions, which I think addresses some of Michael's comments as well, um, which I didn't include in the slide set today. So let's have those as a background and let's have a look at this mature field case. So join, join me on a little trip and it's a mature case. Um, all of these things are much easier in greenfield cases. They are in a sense easier. The, the stakes are higher, but they, they are easy. Uncertainty, is, I would suggest a U-shaped thing, it gives me an excuse to use a nice picture of a U-shaped valley. But uh, the, 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 the invisible y-axis here is the impact of our uncertainties. And of course, they're very big early on because we can make a horrible investment decision, but they're big at the back end as well. And, and I'd, I would rail against the idea that uncertainty uh, goes away over the field life cycle because we have data, simply because towards the end of field life cycles, our questions have changed, which again was a little bit, that comment's just was coming out in the chat then. We're asking different questions, often questions for which we have no data or for where we've created uncertainty by doing things like injecting water into the field. So I would argue uh, uncertainty is evergreen. If I always like to say, if, if there's any time in your company's or a project's life cycle where it's okay to have a complete uh, imbecile running the com company, it's probably here because actually, you know, it's probably gonna be okay no matter what. But here it's not a good idea and here it's not a good idea. So we'll take a mature field case. Uh, so we're gonna go case four, the last one. Uh, Champagne region of France. Uh, this was a published one. You may have seen it before, but uh, it's, it's been to a conference. So thank you to Vermillion for publishing this. Um, it's a nice one to be able to talk about. So the situation here, we're, we've got 30, 30 wells. I think that was about 15 years of history. Uh, it's a light oil. <clears throat> it's a water injection scheme, um, and it's a low net to gross system. It's a fluvial system, so it's channelized. And you can on the left those blue areas. So effective non-reservoir in terms of what we're doing. And the question was, uh, should we drill more infrawells? And it was an interesting one about stochastics. We were actually asked, can you give us a model and show us where to drill next year? Because the last two wells were disappointing. And if the next one's disappointing, we probably won't do it anymore. And the answer was, no, we can't do that because we don't know where the sand is. No one does, but we can do 20 wells. Um, and then there's a silence around the room. Uh, but then said, OK, if you can if you can take that to the board, small company, if you can take that to the board in December for next year's budget, uh, game on. So we started work. 
um, and we started doing, we started it in exactly the wrong way. We started to build a model, a big model covering the whole field. Uh, it was this thing about fit for purpose, which I think came up in Michael's comments. Uh, we quickly realized that, that was going to take forever. Um, a detailed history matching exercise. We didn't want to do that. So instead, we said, OK, what's the decision we're actually really trying to make? Are, we, are they really going to drill 20 wells next year? Well, of course they're not. It's onshore. They will do a pilot study. You know, you would check it because this is a onshore and it's an incremental project. So of course you're going to do a pilot. You're never going, no one's going to give you the money for 20 wells. So um, what we need to do is ask the question, um, can we drill, can we test uh, a dense infill um, uh, project? In which case, the question we're really asking is, you know, would we reuse existing wells? Yes. Is it going to be a five spot pattern? Yes. Um, OK, so what we're really asking for is probably three wells, not 20. Do we know where they're going to go? Do we need a model to show us? Do we need Bayesian inference? Not really. We just need the production data because half of this field is covered in water and the other half is relatively still um, non-watery. And you can see it in the production data. You, mean, you need a bubble map, really high science. So we know where the decision is going to be. It's going to be pretty much in the middle here. Therefore, that's where our efforts need to go because that's where the pilot scheme inevitably is going to run. So in the background, we just need to know about fluxes. So what you're looking at here is a flux model just to get the you know, material balance sorted out and the boundary conditions on the area of interest. And then in the area of interest, we went and made a detailed model which had permeability heterogeneity, which is was the root cause. And the reasons for permeability heterogeneity were the root causes for whether this scheme was going to work or not. So modeled at a scale appropriate to capture, capture the heterogeneity we needed, and then on we go. And that's basically what the scheme was going to look like. And how do we carry the uncertainties? Well, in this case, it was scenario based. Um, so there was essentially this is exploring root causes for why we didn't we couldn't be firm about permeability heterogeneity. I won't describe them all. You can imagine if you were doing this, you imagine what it would look like. So we made those and then we put the dynamic uncertainties on top. And we ended up um, that some of those were independent uncertainties. The dynamic things were independent again. So you ended up with um, these are static cases, but a lot more than five. We actually ended up with a number closer to 70. And um, two weeks to do the sort of history matching part because we're running out of time now. The decision was coming coming close. It was November and a decision had to be made by Christmas. So the way it was done in this case was to say, OK, well, we have now uh, this is a cartoon version of it. So actually there was, there was 70 of these spots. We have a whole pile of static dynamic models here. We are not going to do full field history matching on these. We will history match carefully around the area where the decision is being made. But actually, if I go back here, why on earth would we spend a month history matching all the wells over here when the decision we're making is over here? They have no significant bearing on what's going on in the area where we're making the decision. So, make them all and then don't history match them all, but then history compare. And so what you're seeing here is uh, there, was no, there was never a base case. There was just a collection of possibilities, plausible futures, and they've been plotted in terms of the things we're interested in. And in this particular case, the um, uh, the object functions were recovery, which as is usually the case, but also daily production because um, annual cash flow is important for this uh, company. So those were the two things we're interested in. The modeling was in the interest of where the decision was going to be taken. And then these models were just compared with history. So there was some loose global matching. That was all. But none of this detailed well matching. You simply just made the observation which ones are actually very close naturally, which is in green. They're just traffic lighted and which ones are not so close and they're in red. And you draw a, a lasso around all of that. That's essentially that's our quantification of uncertainty. And then you put a, we haven't mentioned risk much today, but then the risk threshold goes on top, which is the commercial threshold for failure, successful failure. And if you're on the left of that line, basically it wasn't going to work. And if you're on the right, you are. And that was the end of it. And we presented that and they said, OK, you can have three wells. And it worked out well in this case, which is why we were allowed to take it to a conference. But having done that and having subsequently heard about Jeff Kayser's work, I thought, well, this is actually, is, is this not Bayesian evidential learning, but manual? And is what we've got there not an ensemble, but deterministic? 
in its design rather than generated in this case by um, something like the ENK filter. And to be honest, I would my the tease perhaps is I would suggest that it is. It's just a different type of ensemble. It's sort of this. It's sort of this. I suggest. Yeah. Is it OK? Is it OK as an approach? Did we miss anything? Well, I think all I can suggest is it got all the information we had to hand. Uh, it got all the ideas in terms of what could be going on, and it focused it very specifically on the problem at hand. So it's very focused on the decision. And in that respect, you know, it got us to where we needed to go. It was also relatively quick. Um, the reason we didn't make a detailed full field model and history match it was that that process takes longer than this process and we didn't have enough time. And often not being have enough time makes us creative. It's almost easier for a consultancy. If, if someone's going to stop paying you, it sort of focuses your mind and you get quick and you become a bit more innovative. If we'd have had more time, I have a horrible feeling we might have made a full field model. So, Times are running on, so I just want to make some closing comments and then I'll pass back to Chris and Pascal to bring in your comments and thoughts. Uh, I think it's about three, th three slides to close. We've ex explored and discussed a number of workflows. I think we're in this particular audience, we're all agreed that taking a base case model and just hoping for the best is rather inappropriate. So we're all down towards the bottom of that triangle. But the question is, how do we live around the bottom? Do we have a bias one way to statistical solutions or do, or do we have a bias to um, multi-concept solutions? Or can we combine the two? And the three sketches there, I mean, this one here, which is a cartoon version of, of folk who had taken a very strongly, um, strongly statistical approach with really only really one concept underneath that. Uh, down here, there's multiple concepts around the area where the decision is being made. Um, you could take that and put it into this kind of thing where you have discrete scenarios with statistical ensembles around them. You could do that. These are three different ways of approaching essentially the same sort of problem. In principle, I can't really say why you wouldn't, you couldn't get the right answer using any of them. The right answer being at least um, creating a, a modeling environment where you can bring in the available knowledge and explore the what ifs. I think I didn't see why you couldn't achieve that in each of these ways. I've got my own biases, but you know, in a spirit of openness, why, why you could use all of these. I think the onus is on us to simply choose the one which gets us to where we need to go. So if I can dip into Ryan of um, well, the title of the book actually, Making Good Decisions, we choose the technique which helps us to make a good decision, and it's not going to be best technical up here. It could be extraordinarily simple. One of the most effective things I've had in peer reviews from a company we did a lot of work for a few years ago, and it was the same person who came up with the same question pretty much in all the meetings. We made our presentations, we illustrated whatever we'd done, and then he would sit at the back and say, okay, what's the deterministic low? So a nice piece of work, you covered everything, blah, 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 fine, maybe a few tweaks here and there. What is the deterministic low here? Describe the, down case, the downside case that hasn't happened yet, uh, what happens if you do hit an iceberg? Uh, does the company still come out the other side? Or does the project still come out the other side? And if not, we start mitigating. And I, I, I quite like that. I quite like that, the deterministic load, however you get there. Finishing then with the question, um, are ensembles the answer? It, it's a tool. I, it, for me, it's a tool in a toolbox and therefore can be useful. And it's down to us to decide. Um, which workflow should we use? A suggestion? Well, whichever one helps us get to a good decision. Uh, tipping our hat to Rainer Bratfeld's comment. Certainly, it's got to be something that helps create clarity between groups because we are making decisions as groups. Um, whether it's peer reviews, peer assist, partner meetings, working with MPD, we've got, we are basically taking a bunch of people down a path. So one person has a fantastic piece of statistics which no one understands. It might be right, but it's not, it's not a good way of communicating. Um, we need something that creates clarity. We need to be able to create clarity between working groups. And I would argue we need to be able to capture the underlying reservoir concepts visibly. So if someone's done some sketch or multiple sketches or a number of people have done sketches, when you see that spread of statistics, when you look at it, can you see through to the underlying concepts, which, were the, which should have originally been driving it? So basically, whatever, whatever helps us hit the dartboard um, that unfortunately we can't see 
because it's buried two or three kilometers below the ground. OK, Chris and Pascal, back to you. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, uh, I We've just scanning through all the people posting the chats. Uh, there are quite a lot of uh, the same people posting comments uh, here, so we would like to open the floor a bit to for people that haven't spoken at all or haven't uh, expressed themselves. So please raise your hand if you have any uh, burning there, questions. There is one, there is one here. Uh, it's just come in, um, Pascal. Okay. I can't even read the name. Raghavendra. Do you want to come and? Yeah, uh, thanks. I mean, I think it's an observation general from your all your examples that you have been showing is, um, yeah, you shouldn't fall in love with your method. Uh, <laughs> you need to know what task is being assigned to you because you are part of the company and the company is trying to make certain decision. Then, yeah, what uh, what are you trying to solve and then decide the scope of modeling you should uh, do and then you need to have the expertise or insight to know which one can answer this question in using optimum time or resources uh, so that that's an observation i mean basically thanks for taking up this discussion it's uh, many times we kind of think hey, uh, we, we like oh this is the answer or this is the standard way to do it maybe it's you should question that Yes, I think that's right. It's, it's, it is getting back to the yeah, and and debiasing. I think was that that came up quite a few people. It's whatever that helps helps reduce that bias. Yeah, hitting the dark wall we can't see. Yeah, some other comments coming up. Yeah, there's a comment from Ralph Shoes. Uh, but if you can come up and ask the question. OK, thanks. Um, well, my question is on the the usage of the ensemble. So I'm claiming here that the rules and conditions for moving through decision gates seldomly have a notion and an understanding on what an ensemble actually means. And that's a problem because um, when you move in these decision gate processes, you somehow need to keep track on rules, conditions and so on. So if you if the rule set does not really understand what you're talking about, there's no way you can pass through. So my question to you is, don't we have a problem here that the ensemble based approach is not yet ready to be moved through a decision gate process to influence any future of an EPA company? I, th I think so. I think so. And the, it's, it's the thing about creating clarity between groups. It, it often hides, it, 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 well, sometimes, quite often, doesn't create clarity; it creates confusion. And um, but uh, but I can see I can see it as being something that you, you you look into between the decision gates. You know, if if there's a piece of work that increases understanding and creates insight, then that sort of feels like it's useful, doesn't it? It's this thing about modeling for understanding. If if you do an ensemble to create some understanding or to test some relationships between some variables, then why not? Because that. If it creates useful understanding, which can help me help us in the decision we're trying to make, then, then it's making a contribution. But whether an entire thing has to be expressed as an ensemble all the time, that, that's when I guess there's some pushback. Um, so, sometimes not. And, and you know, I came back from a scenario-based thing, and when I was when I was younger, um, I was very dogmatic and said, "This is the way. You know, this is everyone should do it this way." And there's something about age, or perhaps a number of serial disappointments, that makes you say, "Well, actually, sometimes that's the way." Um, but you know, sometimes there are other ways, and which is I quite why I quite like the triangle. The triangle, there's there's reasons to be in different parts of that triangle, and and that, I think it's it's useful for us to rise ourselves above the tools, the level of the tools, and just look down on them all like a toolbox, and then just say, well, now we'll have a bit of ensemble that's going to give us some insight. And then up there seems, but not Mark also. But if it's good at getting disciplines to work and talk to each other, it's got to be a good thing rather than getting people out of their silos if yes that's that's good the if i can give an example of a situation where i saw it done badly when we we're doing the review a big ensemble and when we we did it by interviewing and we went to the petrophysicist and they said well actually i just did the petrophysical part i don't really know what happened next and it turned out only one person in the company actually understood the ensemble um so actually it was on the shoulders of one person and it was quite a big it was a billion dollar decision um so yes, it, it should bring everyone together. Chris, you're right. Sometimes it doesn't if it's picked up and someone picks up the ball and runs with it because they're enthusiastic. That's the risk, I think. Yeah. 
Okay, I see uh, two people have their hands up, uh, <laughs> Saeed and uh, Chowdhury. Maybe we'll take those two quick questions and then uh, we wrap up. Saeed first. Okay, I can start. Uh, thank you, Mark, for a nice presentation. I really like the, um, the summary slide. Uh, there are different approaches. There are deterministic cases. There are ensemble-based cases that we can, uh, for example, look. But I think we shouldn't be uh, scared of the ensemble uh, methods because they're complicated, right? Uh, there is part of solution. Coming back to your DART uh, example, with what we are doing with uh, with ensemble based method is that we are throwing dots, let's say 100 dots, and then we are using the result to to correct or let's say the second round of throwing the dots. So we are analyzing the result, we are getting the feedback, and then we are correcting ourselves towards reaching the target. So this is something that at least when you have uh, a lot of data, dynamic data, we have solid data that you can use to, uh, in a way, to navigate your biases, to navigate your uncertainties. But all of this depends on how much time you have on your project and how much data you have, right? So for some cases, you might have like uh, two months, three months, like the example that you showed, you never get the chance to do ensemble-based method, even building several alternative approaches, uh, alternative models and history match those, right? So. Mm -hmm. A lot of this depends on uh, uh, lots of things, actually, about the timing, about the data that you have. But I just want to point out that we shouldn't be scared of the ensemble-based method just, be, just because they are complicated and difficult to, to QC, for example. Yeah, I think Thank you. Point. And I like the way you describe it. I think you actually, that was the nicest way of saying Bayesian inference without saying Bayesian inference. <laughs> Very nicely put. Crazy. I make it short. Uh, Straight to the point question, if you can. Yes, uh, thanks so much for this uh, session uh, on uncertainty. Something that I'd uh, like to iterate here is we all need to be mindful about any of the non-technical aspects. Uh, that could be a possible root causing enabler or disabler for any of the work that we do for a company or any organization. We have seen that we end up doing a lot of uncertainty analysis, several subsurface realizations, but in our uncertainty matrix or even like uh, stakeholder um, mapping exercise, we, we, we get loose or we get out of line of sight from the non-technical aspects of mm -hmm. a project. Yes, we can become very focused in. Which, which is when we get, yeah, we need to stay focused with a broad focus, don't we? Indeed, the, indeed. Yeah. Uh, many a times it's just not the geology or the or the modeling work that we do, which enables or disables uh, a project moving from one DG gate to the other decision mm -hmm. gate. But it's actually the non-technical aspects as well. Yeah. We all, as a subsurface as professionals, we all need to be very much mindful about that. Yeah, quite well okay. made. Well made. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, to wrap up, then uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Mark uh, for uh, this uh, really good uh, presentation and uh, for uh, making things quite clear on the uh, on the subject of subject matter. Um, I would also like to thank everyone for calling in into this uh, webinar. Uh, but just to to summarize, uh, we see clearly that uh, two three different topics can easily be spin off from this uh, webinar. Um, I would like to invite everyone, if you have any ideas and thoughts on uh, how we can proceed with on these topics, to uh, come forward, uh, contact uh, Adatron, myself or Chris, and then we can arrange for this to uh, take place. Uh, but clearly, this has been a very engaging session. Lots of thoughts, lots of ideas, and lots of people having different comments on uh, how to move this forward. But in all, we need to kind of de bias, and that's something uh, we all agree on. Uh, we need to keep an open mind as a uh, greet. Uh, how do you pronounce the name again? The first lady that you introduced, Chris. Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, oh, it. oh sorry. Yes, yes Garrett. Yes. We need to keep an open mind and keep this open uh, so that we continue the discussion across the different uh, disciplines. Uh, this should not be a subject of the tool we have. We should still try to think outside of the box in terms of the type of uh, tools we're using. And still try the best way we can within the time frame and whatever uh, constraints we have in the company to try to still capture these uncertainties. Because at the end, uh, we want to have uh, uh, profiles and uh, distributions that still comes to. I mean, the reality somehow manages to fit within at the end. 
that's that's it from my side. Yeah. Um, Chris, any closing words? No, I'm very happy with what you've said. But yes, I'd say we we very much encourage people to come forward and we'll have discussions about how we're going to move this forward. And we, we we definitely will come back with more seminars, lunch and learns, etc., on this kind of area. And just uh, thank just you very could, much, Mark. I, I wish I could. I, say, I wish I could read all of the comments. But if there's anyone, if anyone has an issue or any queries, you're very welcome to email me. Catch up with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to be able to actually read them all. Any passing thought for me? We, Daniel, uh, I like all the comments on bias. And, uh, Daniel Kahneman's thought was, you know, if, if you do your uncertainty range and you feel comfortable with the range you end up with, it's too narrow, by definition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Mark. Thank you, everyone.